That night Lou couldn't sleep. The house was friendly, all its small noises were kind. The village felt homely. She could hear a stream finding down to the river below. All evening he had been gentle. They were easy with one another. Their talk went to and fro, quietly and clear. Everything was kind. But the sadness came back on her, sadness and terror. She saw the two young women, girls of eighteen, the mother, the daughter, hesitant but sure of themselves, fearful of their beauty but trusting it, looking out. And herself, she saw whirling in panic through a hole in the years into loveless space. She lay in the neat white bed in the hospitable room and shook from head to toe. She writhed, she dug her nails into her palms. Then she said aloud, This is foolish, he is my friend, I am sure of that at least. He will not take it amiss. She got out of bed and viewed her ghost in the long mirror, naked, white, thin, clutching its shoulders. And at that she slipped on the red dress and went into him. He was asleep. She woke him. Owen, she said, let me be with you, please. I can't sleep. I'm shaking to bits again. Hush, she said. Hush now. What is it? Come in here. We'll sleep. In the bare landscape, in the expectation of the particular place ahead of her, Lou's feelings rose and widened. Between the two simple planes of earth and sky, she entered a happiness she imagined most people had enjoyed and many could still go back to in childhood. The ground delighted her, the rock so evident through its pelt of grass, the blood-red cranesbill, the tufts of thyme, and many more such graces over the vast deposits of sea lily stone. And the sky, as a child might paint it, white clouds pasturing on blue, larks dangling. There's something else you don't know about me, she said. Owen waited. I was in the Bach choir once. Prove it, he said. Stand there on that pulpit stone and sing. Luth stood, folded her hands like a penitent, looked up to heaven and sang. When I was a bachelor, I lived all alone. I worked at the weaver's trade. And the only, only thing that I ever did wrong was to love a fair young maid. I loved her in the winter time and in the summer too. And the only, only thing that I ever did wrong was to keep her from the foggy, foggy dew. One night she came to my bedside as I lay sound asleep. She laid her head upon my breast and she began to weep. She sighed, she cried, she damn near died. She cried, what shall I do? So I took her into bed and I covered up her head just to keep her from the foggy, foggy dew. There she halted. Owen's look halted her. In the silence they heard the larks again, the irrepressible leaps and falls and leapings again of song, and something else, still faintly ahead of them, on the higher ground, they heard water. They climbed. Soon the way levelled across a broad terrace where it was damper and there were orchids, tight magenta spires and also the yellow bog myrtle and this moistening where the water sank was the sign that they were getting close to the place itself the cave where the water issued Owen's few words ceased altogether Lou paused to let him go ahead he shrugged made a little gesture of apology and helplessness he was hauling back the years in broad daylight even before they reached the cave, the boy he had been was repossessing him. But Lou was not put out. She gathered her own happiness down from the sky and off the open country into this young course of water that they were climbing to the cave, its place of issue, that Owen had remembered and wanted her to know. She waved him ahead, content being in herself. The water babbled and sparkled. This was its phase of passage under the sun and moon after the cave and before the yellow and verdant and magenta dampness, the sink. She followed Owen, who had more years in him. She watched his stepping up and up against the water, hurrying down at him. Higher and higher he stepped to the cliff itself, over which the water leapt and offered itself as a rope, a silver ladder for him and her to climb. She would always see it thus, the clear hank of living water let down over the scar for her to climb to the phenomenon the man she loved remembered and had wanted her to see. Owen stood up on the brink, 
from the last foothold, splashed by the toppling water, Lou got two good handholds, two good grips, each into wet clefts, her fingers feeling rock under the moss, and heaved herself up and through in one quick movement of pure ability and lightness. And there they stood, on a broad and stony and flowery ledge, the water sliding fast towards them, towards its fall, and nothing now ahead of them but the cave. The cave stretched all across and came down at either end. Naturally, it resembled a mouth, but not one screaming. It was not open wide enough for that, but sighing, gasping, moaning, in pain or pleasure. Yes, open that wide. The breaths coming out of it were cold. Even where they stood on the brink with Owen, where the stream hurried over, Lou felt the cold breath of the cave. <laughs> 